on to the second attempt of this live stream. Previously, YouTube failed. Let's hope this time the stream stays healthy. So you knew it here from previous many IT security live streams here on this channel and elsewhere on the internet. Intel CPUs, Spectrum Meltdown, many security vulnerabilities that allows to copy and steal data there bit by bit out of even virtual machines and stuff. And now a new, or actually, wait for it, plenty of new vulnerabilities. Starting with new JCC Eratum, new Intel CPU bug, which uh, performance implications on Skylake through Cascade Lake. And they yesterday announced a new jump conditional code Eratum. Eratum. And for you here on this and the other main channel, I went over the instructions and architecture, how CPUs actually work on MIPS and Spark, RISC-V and stuff. And if you want to have a better understanding what we're talking about, this exactly what we talked about in the instructions and architecture, the jump instruction of all instructions, certainly super important. So basically the whole program is always full with if then else and so on. And just this instruction on Intel CPUs since Skylake through Cascade Lake is buggy or better yet not the CPU instruction as it, but the decoded iCache and um, where CPUs could exhibit unpredicted, unpredictable behavior when jump instructions cross cache lines, cache lines on this 32 byte. I think it's written there probably somewhere. Here 32 byte boundary, which is hilarious. So what this means here is that and even I initially read this wrong so much too, if you want to share, like and subscribe to this channel. Initially I thought the jump target, because here are two things, here is where is the jump instruction and the target. Actually initially I assumed they mean the jump, jump target, but no, they mean the jump instruction here as per the previous live streams here on the other channels of us. And so this jump instructions, again, this variable length stuff on x86, super complex because complex instructions and architecture. And so this like basically worked from an XT to uh, 8086, uh, 8086, 8086, 8088, or 2, 3, 4, 586, Pentium, Pentium Pro, and so on. And in 2019, Intel can't even get their jump instruction right anymore. So if it crosses a 32 byte boundary, which apparently, uh, it's, well, this is not like 4K or 8K or 16 megabyte, no, 32 bytes. So basically this is jump instructions all over the place, right? Um, it's, it's hilarious. I really wonder how could they not have found this in testing similar to the AMD random bug. You wonder, do the CPU renders actually do testing and validation? Because the 32 byte boundary, if you imagine here your um, instruction stream of any program, 32 byte is of course not very large. So this jump instruction could potentially very often be on a 32 byte cache boundary here. It's hilarious. They have a microcode update preventing the jump instruction from being cached in the decoded iCache when those instructions cross the 32 byte boundary. I'm actually amazed how much they can tweak in the microcode. Um, really still wonder how that works because this is quite an uh, exotic and intern stuff. I actually wonder how they want to check this in microcode, how that works, especially on a performant way. But so th basically this means as if the new microcode decoding this instruction here encounters a jump instruction on such a 32 byte iCache boundary, then it will simply not use it, I think, or I'm not actually sure if this reporting here, legacy decode pipeline, not really sure if that's entirely accurate. Um, is this even written on, anyway, uh, if we go too much into the detail, that will be slightly too long for this live stream. Um, the performance impact is of course quite significant. Um, probably they have measured it here. I think it was like, was it 4%? There you see some 4% there, 5% there, 10% there. After a while, quite some performance impact is getting together there on, of course, they don't have the performance on the second page. Why should they? Um, I think it was, was it something of 4%? But in any case, of course, you can measure this here. This was old cache. So you see uh, 2000, we could actually, is this here selectable? It is. 
let's see how much that is that is so much from so much here live on this channel 4.6 percent and they have a patch so for windows you would have to live with this um, because certainly nobody will recompile all the software for linux open source bin utils for the gnu assembler intel provided a patch so this is patch and new assembler where this patch to the assembler tries to or not tries avoids jump instructions on such a 32-byte boundary it's hilarious in my opinion um, also again on windows all the legacy and new software in windows certainly nobody is recompiling whole windows and whole applications for the 32-byte boundary nonsense stuff gets increasingly buggy and even on a linux system what is the consequence the consequence is that the assembler will insert some knobs some no operation to move the jump out from the 32 byte boundary and um, 32 byte boundary so what the assembler will do then with this patch is if if it encounters here a jump on such a boundary it will just insert so many knob no operation bytes for instructions to avoid this uh, is the assembler patch linked here i opened it earlier yeah zero to four percent range was written there um, yeah whatever doesn't really matter however if you wonder why is stuff increasingly buggy imagine for each well first of all cpu should not have such bugs and then I would also actually, if I would be the GNU maintainer there of Binute, I would probably say, you know what, our stuff gets too complicated, our code, cluttering this alignment check all over the place for this grave Intel CPU bugs. Also, if I, I don't have any of those CPUs, I think, should check, but I think we don't have any Intel CPUs of this sort in the company, I would actually return this, um, in my opinion, uh, RMA this, and maybe in the USA class action suit because it's hilarious selling it's not a little broken in the meantime like 10 uh, 10 and counting security vulnerabilities including um, now the jump instruction is also defect I can't make this uh, for this we actually have this it's it's hilarious in similar news uh, if you were wondering if Intel if that is all on Intel's front no some below it reloaded Intel processors again vulnerable and the biggest scandal here on this issue is that of course they had an NDA non-disclosure agreement with this researchers here at the TU Gras and this is zombie load previously and actually Intel actually lied according to this reporting um, Intel lied to you the customers in case you have such a CPU because Intel said that the new CPUs whatever that was garlic or something is not affected um, or our casket lake so yeah the variant of zombie load uh, should not work on casket lake and um, however at this point they could hardly get the cpus because they were not yet in retail channels and um, then eventually some cloud provider gave them access and they uh, could test that even back in the day so the security researchers knew already for many months maybe since around April here that this zombie load vulnerability also works on the new cascade lake and Intel said the whole time Intel said no uh, this is fixed by this new cascade lake and now it is surprise surprise security researchers yeah we were not allowed to say something until the other day at uh, 12 um, until 12th of November and this is also hilarious that CPU or any manufacturer says you know what you keep this um, non-disclosed for six months um, it is hilarious in my opinion also Intel sold their defect CPUs and even the jump instruction doesn't work it's you can't make this stuff up anymore it's it's sad and um, why did they accept this because the university I think they say here they have here third party investments to research and development at universities and this is why you would wonder why do universities and security researchers go along with this because they partially to some small percentage or so um, depend on such funding and this is why universities and such accept this even and yeah the uh, updates only effect are mitigating this so much and yeah you get the idea um, 
and also yeah TSX for a complete complete solution to this you would need to disable TSX um, and hyper threading um, so that you would not get any benefits obviously of TSX or um, hyper threading. The whole thing you probably want to read the details here it's hilarious and leave me in the comments below what you think in my opinion. Um, this is completely not acceptable similar to Apple's peak box this is set here. Yeah. Speaking about this, Windows and Linux gets an option to disable Intel TSX to prevent zombie load version 2 reloaded attacks. So um, just after the disclosure, both Microsoft and the Linux kernel teams have added ways to disable support for Intel transactional synchronization extension TSX that opens company CPUs to attacks via zombie load version 2 vulnerability. Is the code name for the vulnerability? Uh, we have just seen it. Allows malware and malicious threat actors to extract information processed inside a CPU information to which they normally shouldn't be allowed to access with um, user space and virtual machines. But the reality of the revolt production environment is that performance matters. Past microport updates for such attacks such as Meltdown, Spectre, Foreshadow, Fallout and also <laughs> means all those names. Uh, 2019 security vulnerabilities are only real with a proper name, you guessed it, and uh, introduce a performance hit of up to 40%. It's like, yeah, so much to Intel CPUs were faster than AMD in previous years, maybe so much to Insecure, you guessed it. You can disable this now um, and probably, um, yeah, we should probably work on open source CPUs and similar stuff. Speaking of which, um, if you guessed the jump instruction and TSX and Spectre Melter and Foreshadow and all this good stuff would be enough. Nope. Intel HPADS, a high precision interval timer or high precision or something, event timer, whatever that was, um, also doesn't work because, nah, don't yet know yet why. Some Coffee Lake platforms have a skewed HPAD timer once the SOC enters PC10 some lower energy state, which is consequence marks TSC as unstable because HPAD is used as a watchdog clock source for TSC. Harry Penn tried to work around it in the clock source watchdog code, thereby certain creating a circular dependency with uh, yeah, water, yada yada. Anyway, disable HPAD on HPET on affected platform because yeah, even we don't right now at Intel probably did it came from Intel, Intel or Canonical. Anyway, so yeah, people also don't really quite, yeah, something it's broken. We don't really know why because yeah, it's Intel and something. 2019 you are high precision event timer stuff also doesn't work anymore because why should stuff between jump instruction, um, memory management unit isolation and virtual machines work in this day and age. Speaking about working in this day and age, the new Ryzen stuff is out. Um, well, at least apparently it looks like some embargo listed. We still don't have one, but other people, I've seen a couple of YouTube videos go live, unfortunately, or fortunately for you, <laughs> unfortunately for us, we are working on growing here these channels. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe to support us. But uh, other people, apparently some benchmarking embargo lifted today and 3950X stuff looks good there from all the stuff to Gamers Nexus, Linus Tech Tips and other new sites. And um, everyone is happy, except we don't have one, but otherwise 16 core benchmark shows that it's faster than Intel 28 core. Also, you need to wonder nowadays, do they, did they measure with all the security mitigation in place? Because certainly 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 15% here and there, uh, eventually stuff adds up a little bit. So faster than Intel 28 core Xeon, but this is just the headline. It's also faster than a lot of core i7 um, epic Ryzen here. So really high here on the CPU mark according to this. Um, and otherwise yeah, Intel Xeon here, uh, Xeon W of yesteryear's Mac Pro, uh, Mac Pro stuff coming soon. Much faster here in this benchmark anyway than Intel Core i9 9980XE and Platinum Gold and you name it. We certainly will try to get the hands on one ASAP for our open source compilation FPGA workload. 
And if you were wondering um, if this is all on Intel's front, then nope. The TPM also is vulnerable. We impact TPM chips on desktops, laptops and server systems. So yeah, I personally never trusted this TPM much in any case, but um, TPM fail lets attackers steal private keys from the TPM. TPM of course being the trusted platform module there in many PCs since probably soon two decades, at least probably 15 years. I'm not really sure. I think maybe Windows is using it for BitLocker keys or something, but I'm, I think most open source software doesn't use it. Leave me in the comments below if you ever used it for something. But a team of academics have disclosed today or yesterday two vulnerabilities known collectively as TPM fail that could allow an attacker to retrieve cryptographic keys stored inside the TPMs. Thanks to the efforts of those research teams, both vulnerabilities have been fixed, which is a good thing since both issues can be weaponized in double real-world attacks, something that's very rare anyway, whatever. And uh, what are trusted here? So it stands for Trusted Platform Module, where separate chips added to the motherboard, where the CPU could store and so on, um, and so on and so forth. Vulnerability CVE 2019-11090 impacts this, as well as a second CVE 16863 impacts the ST33 TPM chip made by ST Microelectronics. Incredible popular wide array of devices ranging from network equipment to cloud servers and so on. The attacks, uh, security timing leakage, similar to other timing attacks, all based on the amount of time the TPM takes to do the same thing over and over again. Uh, while it sounds like a narrow attack surface, these two are common digital signature schemes used in many today's cryptographic security operations and so on. You get the idea, although I'm not really sure if it's used for TLS as written here, but anyway, they are practical, the research team said about TPM fail. Yeah, leave me in the comments below if you ever use the TPM for something. I didn't really use it for anything, even on Apple's side. I think Apple is not using this. Apple is using the SMC and now the T2 security chip. So probably that is differently attacked. In other news, there is a new bytecode alliance for web code, a web for web assembly. Um, Mozilla, Intel, and yeah, Intel of all security of <coughs> Red Hat um, want to push the web assembly bytecode to cloud stuff. They have a vision of secure by default WebAssembly ecosystem for all platforms. Actually similar to what I was thinking with my potentially maybe from scratch microkernel stuff where I was also considering maybe you're reusing WebAssembly for not reinventing the wheel. So they had also, you see, same idiots, similar or different, different idiots, similar ideas. And if this is a good thing, I'm not sure somehow sometimes stuff looks good and in the end doesn't really work. But they want to use this for cloud devices. The one thing is, of course, um, which architecture. So they have now a, um, a new platform of WASM time, crane lift, and supporting Linux and stuff. What is a good thing for you is today, you could use this here from their Git repository and run WASM WebAssembly stuff on the command line for your command line stuff, which is something I wanted to try anyway. Uh, just that their code usually is a little bit uh, large. So yeah, modern email address is not info nowadays. It's hello at bytecode alliance. But whatever, press release articles, WebAssembly and vision. What is the vision? Um, yeah, so they also want to bring this to cloud devices, as I probably said, and um, also one thing yeah, right, I wanted to shout this out, they have the industry of putting together users, putting our users at risk more and more every day. What? As an industry? So they, <laughs> this is funny, only live on this channel, they, they confirm and write and that as an industry, they all are putting their users at risk more and more every day. Like, thank you for confirming that here on our recurring security channel. 80% of the code base comes from package repositories like npm, pypy, crates.io, yeah, also recurring shout out here to all those failing stuff there. 
And what is also the risk, and we recurrently mentioned here that people just take the stuff, they don't review it, they hope it works, and then it's full with security vulnerabilities. And they want to mitigate this here by turning to WSM. I don't really see this working, so I would I, I personally only would have used the just interim compiler for portable performance. But how this WebAssembly stuff should solve this problem of repositories with security vulnerabilities is not really entirely clear to me. Um, we certainly need to write software differently and not just have some other repository in WebAssembly that for sure doesn't solve anything. We just have different repositories with different security vulnerabilities. So um, what the big guys are exploiting here is that gotten their users to trust them and when a user starts up the applications like give you codes and keys in the house and yeah whatever. Anyway maybe something to review another day. As a community they have a choice. WebAssembly ecosystem would provide a solution here at least if they choose to design in a way that's secure by default. Um, yeah not really sure how this are. Also maybe they mean like putting all the stuff in a sandbox always but anyway um, it stands for the user here, the future code busy, can't use, protect themselves, what, yeah, what, 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 <laughs> the what, Bycode Alliance is a group of companies here, yada, yada, whatever. We probably take a closer look another day, um, just this stuff is coming. If you were wondering, Cisco Adaptive Security Appliance Software and Firepower Threat Defense Software Remote stuff is secure, then I have bad news, this snake oil stuff, and wishful thinking is of course has a new weekly Cisco remote code execution vulnerability here 2019-15992 and the vulnerability in the implementation of the Lua interpreter here by the way recurring stuff here right and uh, integrated in the Cisco adaptive security plans also yeah super complicated stuff right one module here one module there something there and insecure. Also maybe we should just write much simpler. Even Intel CPUs, right? Intel CPUs so complex they can't do jump instruction correctly and um, threat is adaptive security appliance stuff also so complicated with so many modules. Yeah, some vulnerability left, another right. Allows Lua function calls within the context of a user supplied Lua script like yeah, no, I don't know. I don't even anymore. You had one job, but successfully exploit could allow the attacker to trigger a heap overflow condition, execute arbitrary code with root privileges on the underlying Linux operating system. And there you see even using Linux and Lua and stuff doesn't make everything secure. If you combine all the stuff with um, out checking all the authentication and the privileges then here yeah, then you get a fine remote code execution vulnerability. Speaking of uh, maybe we make this first oops um, one news is uh, 2019 you thought open source is amazing right here yeah, announced Mesa 1924 because um, which is available immediately. It's an emergency release to fix a critical bug found in Mesa 19.2.3 release which caused incomplete rendering on all Mesa drivers like yeah they just released so much to testing infrastructure. I slightly wonder do they even have testing infrastructure. I so need to hurry with our low level code and microkernel. I really wonder um, how do they not. But the problem is of course with a lot of vintage Linux code that there is not a lot of testing infrastructure, even the Linux kernel, they just like basically compile and boot and hope for the best. They have very little test infrastructure and you would think in three decades of Linux, they would have in the meantime, ten thousands of test cases and can even without booting um, like test modules, even on the assembly level, like running it through an emulation like QEMU, not even the whole kernel, but like file system modules. Um, linking them with some stub stuff. There is so many possibilities that certainly I probably should get into. If you like all those ideas, don't forget to share, like and subscribe and support us for our future potential hopefully soon work on microkernel stuff because I can't see all those bugs anymore. 30 years and counting, it's hilarious. 
immediate update because previous Mesa release. So don't use Mesa 19.2.3 because it has incomplete rendering for all Mesa drivers. You guessed it. Speaking about a more amazing Mesa driver, on a previous live stream here on this channel, um, some viewer shouted out that they could disable Secure Boot on the Microsoft Surface X Pro or so, this new ARM-based device. And I only wanted to mention, hey, this fr uh, free Adreno uh, added support for this Adreno 16640 ID, um, the A. Adreno 640 seems to work without any changes. GLMark and VK Cube here on as uh, contributor signed off and reviewed here by uh, private people and Google. So this change also to inspire you to get into this. You see the stuff is so buggy. You if even if you're a beginner, just look at something. You most likely find some bug. And otherwise, even some that is a cool thing. That is why I want simple stuff that is compatible. Because if stuff is simple, then even if a new silicon revision is faster, more processing cores and stuff, then adding device support um, it might be as simple as just filling it in in some case switch cases here. That is apparently according to this patch all it takes to. Um, on top of 630 support 640 and I would hope that maybe this even matches to the Microsoft Surface that previous people here on, on this viewers, amazing viewers by the way, I love this comments and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, also in general if you have something to track around it's always the lowest hanging fruit just to add the device ID. If you are lucky it might just work just like for those people here. About not the most amazing news here, you guessed it in really strange turn of events. Password manager 1Password um, has raises first round of venture capital. What could possibly go wrong, right? Exactly why I don't use such kind of products at all. Because there is a day that this service either gets hacked, uh, has a security. Also, there have already been security vulnerabilities in 1Password. We probably could and should fact check this one password security um, vulnerability and um, list of security vulnerabilities let's see here cve details one password so at least uh, apparently two and some cross-site scripting in troubleshooting report system feature in and jiggly bits one password might allow remote attackers inject arbitrary scripts and one password application for Android is affected the null of service vulnerability. I thought actually there were more. I'm slightly wondering that this others only two. Anyway, pretty sure there were more. But not only security vulnerabilities and stuff, but then yeah, what could possibly possibly go wrong with all the other failed investments of investing in stuff that I don't know what they want to do now. Toronto-based company known formerly as Agile. Agile Bits Inc. is preparing to expand further into service, servicing enterprise customers, um, paywalls because Wall Street Journal. Anyway, raised 20 million in venture capital funding, first capital raised of any kind, said the chief executive Jeff Shiner. Uh, totally skeptical, can't really recommend this. Also, I wonder a little bit um, what do they want to supply their enterprise customer. This is service, um, it's, yeah, leave in the comments below what you think, but certainly raising some warning signs there for the future of this stuff. Speaking about accepting cookies, so Google has access to detailed health rock records of ten, tens of millions of Americans project. Nightingale is an attempt to squeeze more money from patients. <coughs> what could possibly go wrong, right? Give Google all your data. Google quietly partnered last year with Arsension, the country's second largest health system and has since gained access to detailed medical records on tens of millions of Americans, according to November 11th report, Wall Street Journal. Deva codename Project Nightingale has enabled at least 150 Google employees to see patient health information, which includes diagnosis, laboratory test results, I mean, seriously, uh, that is a sad future here we are living in. I also wonder why so many people after so many scandals, reports, security vulnerabilities and yeah, discussions in newspapers and stuff, why people still continue with this. It's always 
um, yeah, just getting a tiny little 1% discount or this is, yeah, massive data sharing project with Google has multiple objectives for Google's part of companies developing new software that employs artificial intelligence and machine learning to make care suggestions for individual patients. Google ultim uh, Google's ultimate goal is to develop a search level cloud-based tool to host and examine massive amounts of patient data, which could then market to other health systems and ascensions. Aim is in part to improve the patient's care with projects with the project internal documents, see and you know, whatever, and transforming care. Um, not not amused, um, totally skeptical what could possibly go wrong, right? I mean, I see the patient's health record leaked soon all over the place. And, and also, even we have seen this in previous news, uh, algorithms biased heavily to people of color and, and other things. It's set and a huge warning sign and as usual looking forward to your input. What you think of limited time of what is even here is um, that we anyway um, open source code will survive the apocalypse. So yeah, all the buggy security vulnerability uh, laden open source code will survive the apocalypse in an Arctic cave. GitHub. Um, by the way, I hope you're not screaming. Can we? What is this? all about. Oh. Don't want to. Anyway, GitHub is preparing for a different kind of end of the world. Um, the last stop for civilization before the North Pole in Svalbard and archaeologic archipelago north of mainland Norway along the 80s parallel. Most of the and so on Russian coal mines have shut down, so locals have rebranded their vast acres of permafrost, uh, also permafrost throwing up right but anyway so they want to um, store some open source there some Linux and uh, what is it even Linux and Android so the first real um, 200 patterns each carrying so how do they also yeah for github which Microsoft brought last year plans to become by far the biggest tenant what um, says the material could lines of code where basically microfilm so where do they have it here simple door uh, moving reels old school basically microfilm help to with the help of a magnific magnification glass you or say end of time survivors can see the data be in pictures text lines of code norwegian company makes uh, specialized rolls super durable film yeah also they super durable today probably falling apart in 100 years and 750 to 2000 here maybe if you believe the advertising cold dry low oxygen cave and uh, the first reel to include linux the android operating system yeah um is this the ma most amazing code i don't know plus 6000 other important open source applications i wonder which anyway you wonder also if yeah okay the source code you could theoretically compile certainly learn something from that but yeah anyway you saw it here the end is uh, apocalypse is near certainly with all the zombie load uh, TPM and uh, jump instructions not working. Um, hope you learned something, found this interesting and got here the latest and greatest briefing here of what is wrong in today's Intel and open source and uh, not open source antivirus snake oil world. Thank you for asking how I am, uh, how are you? I hope you're doing fine as well. Thanks for tuning in. Looking forward to your comments, leave below what you think of all this fail from Intel to antivirus to TPM and storing open source in permafrost reels there in the Arctic. Hope to see you soon. Don't forget to share, like and subscribe and see you next time.